So now as we continue our look at the different types of respiratory structures, what we're going to sort of shift gears now is a movement from water, which was mainly through gills as a respiratory structure, and now to land. And when you move to land, what you're going to have to utilize or do is gas exchange no longer with the water, but with air. And there are going to be different ways to do this. So when you are on land and you're doing gas exchange with the air, uh, a common question that you should ask yourself is, well, why did we ditch the gills? Why are there no gills in you and I? Who are, me and you, we are terrestrial organisms. We are organisms that live on land. Why don't we have gills? Why didn't we just continue this really efficient structure that's good at maximizing diffusion and therefore increasing and encouraging gas exchange? Well, gills needed some requirements. First of all, they needed a very moist environment. They are going to uh, undergo desiccation. They will certainly dry out if they are on land. And that was a problem faced by many of the earlier evolving organisms going towards land. So desiccation is a problem on land. In addition, the fact that it's dry, it's no longer wet. In addition, there's no support for these gills on land. These gills are large structures. They're very sort of heavy structures that are well supported by water because water allows for some sort of buoyant force. It encourages things to sort of float. And gills were no exception to that. Gills were supported by H2O. And remember, gills were an evaginated structure. They were on the outside of the body. And they were very well supported on the outside of the body because in water, the effect of gravity is, of course, not going to be as influential as it is on land. If you have this big bony thing on the outside of you when you're moving towards land as a terrestrial organism, that big thing is going to really slow you down and it really does not have any support as an exterior outer structure. So that's why gills were not necessarily useful on land. They dried out and they had no support because there was no longer any water. So what is useful on land? If, if you want to complete gas exchange with air, aka if you want to do respiration on land, there are two major types of respiratory structures that are seen in nature. Two major types of respiratory structures. So we've covered two types of respiratory structures thus far. Those were body surfaces and gills. And now what we're looking at are the ones that are specific to land. These will be tracheal systems, and these are specifically really confined to insects. They're very uh, much uh, representative of insects and how they breathe on land versus also the other respiratory structure, something you're probably quite familiar with, which would be lungs. Lungs are very good, um, and they're useful and utilized by animals, whereas tracheal systems are utilized by insects. So what we're going to now focus on is tracheal systems and how they defeat these problems and allow for gas exchange with the air. So let's do that on this side of the flowchart. So we have tracheal systems. This is our third out of the four respiratory structures that we said we would cover. Remember, these are seen in insects. Remember, insects are small organisms. They're arthropods, um, so they don't have a lot of space to really need to move all of this oxygen and moving the oxygen from a place of uh, uh, from a high content area to a low content area, there's not that much distance to cover. Keep that in mind for right now. So tracheal systems are found in insects. They're visually represented nicely in figure 42.23. So in order to understand how they work, what we need to characterize them by is specifically a network. Tracheal systems represent themselves as a network of air tubes. Tubes are sort of these structures that are going to carry air. It's a bunch of them. And these tubes that are carrying air throughout the body. And they do that by branching out. These tubes that branch throughout the insect's body. From the top to the bottom, from left to right, dorsal to ventral, anterior to posterior, however you want to call it. This is all over the body. That's why it's called a tracheal system. Throughout the systems, it's a systemic network of tubes that branch throughout the body. This branching is going to be critical. What we need to first understand before we get to the branching is where does the branching start or originate? What is the true source of this system? And that is the trachea. Insects will possess this structure known as a trachea. 
Trachea will be considered the largest of this tube network. It's the largest of the tubes that do this carrying of air to the places of need. And the trachea is going to be very much open to the outside air environment. It invites the outside air environment in it. It wants to be within indirect a sort of a contact with the outside air environment. And that's because trachea, as the largest tubes of this network of tubes within insects, are going to continuously now begin branching because they're very much in contact with the air. And in order for a, this large tube to sort of branch out and get the other cells throughout the body of this insect in contact with air, you need to have constant branching of the trachea. And that's what exactly happens. We have a continuously branching um, trachea that's going to branch into finer and finer, much more smaller, even microscopic levels of branches. So much so that what we eventually have is this is this branching will happen until the entire system is in contact, the entire tracheal system that is, is in contact with almost every single one of the cells in the uh, in the insect's body. So we'll say in contact with all cells, and it's not all, but like most, like 99% of cells in the insect's body. We'll just say all cells for just to keep things simple. So look at this. We have a large tube. That tube branches into smaller and smaller tubes all the way until every single cell within the insect's body has a tube next to it. Why is this useful? Well, that's useful because if you have a tube next to you, this is what's going to allow for gas exchange. You're a cell. You're a respiring cell. You're going to do cell work. You need oxygen. You need gas exchange. You need oxygen to get to you. Gas exchange will happen and get to you because gas exchange occurs across and remember, gases like to dissolve in a moist environment, and that's exactly what happens here. The ends of the trachea, the ends of the networks, this, these branches, are going to have moist epithelium. That's going to be on their tips. So gas exchange occurs across a moist epithelium that lines the tips of the tracheal system. That lines tips of tracheal branches. So basically, these branch tips that are all throughout the body, almost connected to or near every single cell that's respiring, are going to be moist, and they're going to allow for a very, very nice gas exchange of oxygen to occur from the outside environment to an area of need like the cells. A lot of insecticides, things that kill insects, actually are going to target this. They're going to deliberately cover these tips of the tracheal branches with like an oily substance of some sort to block any sort of air entry tree that's possible, any sort of air diffusion or dissolving across the moist epithelium, thus causing every single cell that's in contact or needs oxygen not getting the oxygen because the insecticide is blocking these tips from being the moist epithelium that they should be. Overall, what we get in a tracheal system is O2 and CO2 transport, that's the goal of any gas exchange system within a respiring organism. And when you have this O2 and CO2 transport in an insect, this actually occurs all without a circulatory system. All without a CS. We never mentioned the use of blood. All we mentioned was the use of these tubes. Yes, they sort of represent or are kind of like blood vessels, but they're not carrying any sort of liquid in them, any sort of blood-like material. All they're carrying in them is air. We said that it's a network of air tubes. Therefore, it's without a circulatory system. Again, this is due to the fact, due to air being brought so close, air being brought so close, air being brought so close to nearly every cell. How did it get so close to nearly every cell? Well, that's because that large trachea, that large tube, branched into such smaller tubes, such finer branches, that almost every cell was in contact with the outside environment through a tube-like gas exchange mechanism. That covers our look at the tracheal systems, and now what we're going to be focusing on are these very powerful, very efficient, very successful lungs seen mainly uh, on the human perspective inside of things.